Good evening, everyone. My name is Sasha Rose Neal, and I'm the Vice Chancellor of the University of Sussex. And it's my enormous pleasure to welcome you all to the Attenborough Centre this evening for this inaugural lecture. An inaugural professorial lecture is a very special moment at which the university marks the appointment or promotion of a new professor and gathers to hear from them some of the thinking that has contributed to their award of the title Professor. I'm very much looking forward to my first inaugural lecture at Sussex and particularly to hearing from my colleague, Professor David Rubain. David is our Pro Vice-Chancellor for Culture, Equality and Inclusion. Prior to his appointment at Sussex last year, he was Chief Executive of the Conservatoire for Dance and Drama and before that, Chief Executive of the Equality Challenge Unit, a policy and research agency set up to advance equality, diversity and inclusion in the UK further and higher education and research sectors. David began his career as a lawyer and was a solicitor for 21 years, latterly as Director of Legal Policy at the Equality and Human Rights Commission of Great Britain, following a career in private practice as a partner and a founder at the Department of Education, Equality and Disability Law at Levine Solicitors. In addition to his current role, David is Visiting Professor of Law at Birkbeck, University of London, and Equality Advisor to the Premier League, which is, I think, particularly impressive, um, and a fellow of the British American Project and a consultant to Black Thrive Global and the EW Group. David has published and taught widely on education, disability and equality law and practice and has been involved in numerous voluntary and other organisations. He's a past chair of the Law Society of England and Wales Mental Health and Disability Committee. He was an expert to the European Union a member of the, of the Editorial Board of Disability and Society, a board member of Equinet, the European Network of Equality Bodies, and a former member of the advisory group of OFFER, the Office for Fair Access. He's co-editor of Blackstone's Guide to the Equality Act, fourth edition just recently published, and of Equality, Disability and Social Policy, the second edition of which has just been commissioned. Most recently, he co-presented Colloquia with Yates Norton, on disability, interdependence and allyship, and with whom he's recently published on Radical Belonging, an exploration of disability, commitment, interdependence and care. David is the winner of Radar's People of the Year Award for, the achievement, for achievement in the furtherance of human rights of disabled people in the UK in 2002. He was shortlisted for the Law Society's Gazette Centenary Award for Lifetime Achievement for Human Rights in November 2003. In August 2006, David was listed as one of the 25 most influential disabled people in the UK by Disability Now magazine, and in 2013 listed in the Disability News Services Influence Index. He's also listed in the Disability Power Lists, October 2014, 2015, and 2017. And just last week, he received an honorary doctorate from the University of Law for his outstanding contribution to equality, diversity, and inclusion and the furtherance of human rights for disabled people. It's really a huge honour to be here to listen to David tonight. And his lecture is called, Can the Law Deliver Inclusion? Over to you, David. Thank you, Sasha, for that really kind introduction. Um, and good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for coming, despite rain and landslides, apparently. Um, in my time, I've spoken at a lot of public events. If I'm honest, I really like public speaking. However, the bar of an inaugural professorial lecture is high, and so this is possibly one of the most terrifying. Um, I, this evening, would like to explore whether law, specifically British law, can bring about an inclusive society. I will begin by reflecting on the nature of inclusion and why we might want it before considering its legal history and parameters, its impact, strengths and weaknesses, and then touch on contrasting perspectives. I'll draw on my experience as a practicing solicitor and in policy development and conclude with some thoughts from personal experience, including as a disabled person. Before I begin, there are many to whom I owe thanks, past and present colleagues, including lawyers, and activists, friends and family. For now, I would like to mention the following who are here tonight. Henry Bonsor, 
a Sussex University award-winning master's graduate who provided considerable help with research, two colleagues from the School of Law, Politics and Sociology here at Sussex, Professor Amir Paz Fuchs, who listened and responded to my thoughts, and Head of School Professor Jo Moran Ellis. In fact, she's not here, she's got COVID, but still mention her anyway, uh, who facilitated and supported this event. And Neve Cameron, a, Sus a Sussex graduate and graduate events associate, who along with colleagues in the events team organized this event. I would also like to mention a few other friends, Hannah, Meg and Jack Cinnamon, Mark Hopper, Bruce Stanley, Fiona Mackay, a human rights lawyer, Professor Tom Shakespeare, who's been centrally involved in disability liberation work, all who have listened and responded to a draft of this lecture. And finally, my companion, Yates Norton, about whom I will return later. And there are one or two others in the audience I'll be mentioning. So what is inclusion? As it happens, we've set out a definition of this in the university's recently refreshed Inclusive Sussex strategy. Inclusion is the process of ensuring that diversity, people with different identities and beliefs and from different backgrounds, can thrive and not merely seek to fit into an otherwise homogenous culture or environment. In summary, it's about ensuring the success of people with diverse identities, beliefs, and backgrounds. It is distinct from the concept of equality, which is a quasi-legal idea essentially concerned with fairness. Why is inclusion important? There's plenty of research to demonstrate that diversity improves outcomes and that diverse organizations do better, perhaps instrumentally, that it improves the bottom line. But I think that there is a more fundamental reason relating to the intrinsic nature of humans. Before I consider this further, I think that there is a prior question of why, as a community, we might be undiverse or even exclusive. There's far more that can be said about this than can be given justice to tonight, but I tend towards a, cri a critical analysis of exclusion or oppression, which focuses on historical conflict and consequential structures and systems, rather than exclusively current behavior, although that does matter. So we can't really understand racism outside of historic considerations of slavery and colonialism, nor sexism or indeed homophobia without an analysis of patriarchy and so on. These are epistemological frameworks that justify subjugation, which continue to play out today. So it's not just about eliminating offensive or hurtful speech and behavior, nor indeed is it just about being nice to others. It's also worth mentioning that one consequence of this is that the concept of oppression is not about just any disadvantage that a person might face, but rather where that is structurally driven, or to coin a phrase, prejudice with power. Essentially, we are social creatures, by which I mean we thrive in community with others. That's obviously not an original thought. No man is an island, said John Donne, a maxim explored by numerous other artists and philosophers. In Buddhism, Pratityasamutpada, commonly translated as dependent origination or dependent arising, is the principle that all dharmas or phenomena arise in dependence upon other dharmas. So if this exists, that exists. If this ceases to exist, that ceases to exist. While solitude can be nourishing, ultimately we thrive in relationship with others. Meanwhile, identities, particularly those which purportedly set us apart from others, are to a considerable extent a product of our societies, a construct regardless of whether or not they are immutable. I recognize there's a lot to unpack there, but that's for another time. Whether we're old or young, black or white, disabled or non-disabled, and so on, does matter, but I contend principally in the context of temporal considerations, such as what we are taught to value, how the environment is designed, how we are organized, and hence, at least in part, a function of societal division and oppression. Outside of these ideological constructs, we are merely human, or perhaps commonly human, or as my friend Micheline Mason wrote, incurably human. And as social animals, I contend that anything which separates us or pushes us to coalesce towards homogeneity and hence against others who are different is damaging to each of us, even where we may not notice and even indeed where we may attain privilege. That is not, by the way, an argument against organizing in groups of people with 
the same or similar identity for some specific purpose. We may need or want that for lots of very understandable and good reasons. But I would like to advocate for our interdependence across identity, not only because we have more in common, but particularly because division and separation is personally as well as existentially damaging to each of us. I will return to this, but first I would like to consider the development of British law in relation to inclusion and against its antagonists, inequality and oppression. I will run through a timeline of key equality legislation, though there are of course many earlier instances of progress, such as the Equal Franchise Act 1928, which granted women the right to vote on the same terms as men. And briefly, the attendant sociological and political drivers, though there are many other excellent narratives and a full exposition would require much more time. To begin. In the latter half of the 20th century, people principally from British colonies and then the Commonwealth, including many who had served in the British Armed Forces during the Second World War, migrated to Britain to help fill post-war UK labour shortages. Broadly, this continued until the 1971 Immigration Act, when Commonwealth citizens already living in the UK were given indefinite leave to remain. After this, a British passport holder born overseas could only settle in the UK with both a work permit and proof of a parent or grandparent being born in, in the UK. They became known as the Windrush generation, after HMT Empire Windrush, which arrived from Jamaica on 22nd June 1948. As is now very well documented, they faced overt and cruel racism, typically captured in the, quote, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish signs erected by white British landlords, and of course infamously set out in Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech in April 1968. Campaign groups such as CARD, the Campaign Against Racial Discrimination, and others were formed to lobby for legislation to protect against racial discrimination. And so the first piece of anti-discrimination law in Britain was the Race Relations Act 1965. The act prohibited discrimination on grounds of colour, race or ethnic or national origins, but only in the limited instance of places of public resort. The act also established the Race Relations Board to investigate complaints of unlawful discrimination. Next up, although not explicitly a piece of equality law, it is worth referencing the Sexual Offences Act 1967, which decriminalised male homosexual acts in England and Wales, but only on the condition that they were, quote, in private, unquote, i.e. no more than two people present, and between two men who had attained the age of 21. Note that the same was not extended to Scotland until 1980 and Northern Ireland until 1982. Hitherto, male homosexuality was illegal, at the with, was illegal, with buggery technically punishable by imprisonment for life. Interestingly, lesbians had not been similarly criminalised, purportedly because Queen Victoria didn't believe that they existed, although that view is contested. <laughs> it's important to note that full equality did not arise until the 21st century, and in the interim, the Conservative Thatcher government passed the infamous Clause 28, otherwise known as Section 2A of the Local Government Act 1988, which banned state schools from teaching or promoting the, quote, acceptability of homosexuality as a pretended family relationship, unquote. Meanwhile, it's also notable that prosecutions for homosexual behavior for under 21-year-olds or not in private actually went up in the years following the 1967 Act. The 1967 Act was the culmination of several attempts to implement the findings of the Wolfenden Committee, which had been tasked in 1954 with bringing legislation into line with modern wars. The Homosexual Law Reform Society had campaigned for these changes, and it was later followed by the Campaign for Homosexual Equality, Pride, Stonewall, and other increasingly vocal organizations who pressed for change. Back to racism. The need to strengthen the 1965 Act had become clearer when persistent, egregious racism was highlighted in a report published by Political Economic Planning, a think tank which would later become the Policy Studies Institute, entitled A Survey of Racial Discrimination in England, alongside pressure from the Race Relations Board. And so the Race Relations Act 1968 extended protection to include discrimination within employment, housing, goods and services, public services, and membership of a trade union. The board was given powers to bring civil proceedings against those who were found to have discriminated. 
However, a major omission from protection was the exemption granted to the police in their operational duties. On to sexism. Before 1970, it was common practice for there to be separate lower women's rates of pay. For example, at the Ford Motor Company, there had been four grades for production workers. Male, skilled, male, semi-skilled, male, unskilled, and female. On 7th June 1968, 850 women machinists working at the Ford factory in Dagenham went on strike for equal pay after discovering that they were being paid 15% less than men for doing the same work. The demands of these women, memorialised in the 2010 film Made in Dagenham, paved the way for the Equal Pay Act 1970. The effect of the Act was to remove separate lower women's rates of pay and hence was the first piece of legislation that enshrined the right to pay equality between men, women and men. It gave an individual a right to the same contractual pay and benefits as a person of the opposite sex in the same employment, where both undertook like or e equivalent work. Nevertheless, job advertisements continue to advertise roles exclusively for males or females, and, advertised, and advertisers showed women in stereotypical roles of domesticity or in submissive work, and sometimes still do. Meanwhile, there was a significant increase in activism through what became known as second wave feminism. The Women's Liberation Movement held their first conference in 1970, which also saw disruption of the Miss World pageant, and both Spare Rib and Red Rag were first published in 1972. Eventually, the Sex Discrimination Act 1975 made it unlawful to discriminate directly or indirectly against either sex and set up the Equal Opportunities Commission, EOC. Back to racism again. By the early 1970s, it was becoming clearer that confidence in the framework established by the 1965 and 1968 Acts was diminishing. Discrimination was still widespread and the number of successful complaints to the Race Relations Board had remained consistently low. Aligning with sex discrimination law, the Race Relations Act 1976 extended unlawful race discrimination and re replaced the Race Relations Board and the Community Relations Commission with the new Commission for Racial Equality. Complaints could now be brought directly to civil courts or industrial tribunals, now employment tribunals, and the CRE was given powers to enforce legislation and conduct inquiries. And for about 20 years, that was it. However, since the 1960s, disabled people had begun to organise against their oppression. As with other liberation movements, there are many stories of key people, organisations and events, too many to fully recount in this lecture, but I will highlight a few. Paul Hunt was a disabled person, and as was much more common for disabled people then, a resident of a care home, Lee Court, run by a charity, Leonard Cheshire. Lee Court was a semi-self-help community where each resident contributed. Some washed up, some cooked, some mowed the lawns, everyone took part. However, changes to state-organised welfare resulted in a shift of authority to a management committee of non-disabled non-residents. The residents resisted the change. They went on to stage a pyjama protest, mass defiance of the rule that they had to change into their pyjamas by 6pm. Their protests earned them eviction notices, only rescinded following a direct appeal to group captain Leonard Cheshire himself. However, the real crunch came one dinner time when the matron read out the following new rules without any prior discussion or consultation. One, all TVs off by 10.30 p.m. Two, everyone needing help to be in bed by 11 p.m. Three, residents wishing to go out after dark must ask for permission. And my favourite, four, no public exposure of bodies in hot weather. Clearly, this would terrify non-disabled people. Paul saw disabled people's place as being in the community. In addition, he increasingly felt that existing, long-established disability organisations did not reflect the interests of disabled people and that disabled people should organise and form their own organisations. He wrote a letter to that effect to The Guardian, published on 20th September 1972. The result of this and related developments was a growth of activism, self-organised groups of not for disabled people, 
and a disability movement which led protests about independent living, rights not charity, representation in the media, access to employment, housing and services, and inclusive culture, education and art. Fundamentally, it led to disabled academics and others developing the social model of disability. Whereas the traditional charity or medical models called for prevention, repair or rehabilitation, the social model demanded a change in society through civil rights. It is important to note that this activism and ambition learned from the black civil rights and feminist campaigns, adopting and adapting their tactics, including snappy slogans like nothing about us without us, rights not charity, and the pithy piss on pity. My favourite, that was. By the early 1990s, thousands of protesters were taking to the streets, demanding new anti-discrimination legislation for disabled people. These protests were led by the Rights Now cam campaign, of which I was vice chair. And in the audience is Adam Thomas, who was coordinator, and Agnes Fletcher, an activist, who was information manager at Disability Awareness in, in Action at the time. And the activities included those of the Disabled People's Direct Action Network, DAN. I personally remember the Stop Telethon demonstrations outside of ITV, which resulted in the station going off air as disabled people invaded the studio. And some of you may have seen the recent television drama, Then Barbara Met Allen, which memorialized, somewhat inaccurately, Dan. Eventually, after much resistance to change by the government, in 1995, the Disability Discrimination Act was enacted, the first piece of legislation protecting disabled people against various forms of discrimination, and in fact, the first equality law under a conservative administration. The act eventually gave disabled people new rights against discrimination in and for reasonable adjustments to a whole range of areas, including those covered by sex discrimination and race discrimination law. After their victory in 1997, the Labour government accelerated equality and human rights legal protections. They moved swiftly to incorporate the European Convention on Human Rights into UK law through the Human Rights Act 1998, which enabled claims to be brought in a British court. The Act also requires new laws to be human rights compatible, courts to interpret existing laws in ways which are compatible, and public bodies to respect and protect human rights. In summary, these are rights to life, to prohibition against torture and slavery, to liberty and security, to a fair trial and due process, to respect for private and family life, freedom of thought, conscience, religion, expression, assembly and association, to marry, to protection of property, to education, and to free and fair elections. And also requires non-discrimination in respect of each. Then, the Disability Rights Commission Act 1999 established that body, Britain's first, sorry, third Equality Commission, alongside the CRE and EOC. 1999 also saw the passing of the Sex Discrimination Gender Reassignment Regulations, which prohibited discrimination in employment and vocational training for people intending to have who were currently undergoing or who had already undergone gender reassignment. Many of you will recall in 1993 the awful murder by white men of Stephen Lawrence, a young black student waiting at a bus stop. Racist violence was, of course, by no means unusual, but following persistent campaigning and a commitment by the Labour Party in their 1997 general election manifesto, the new Home Secretary, Jack Straw, established a public inquiry chaired by Sir William McPherson, a retired High Court judge and former soldier, and advised by Tom Cook, a retired Deputy Chief Constable, Dr John Sentamu, the Bishop of Stepney and later Archbishop of York, and Dr Richard Stone, the chair of the Jewish Council for Racial Equality. Published in February 1999, the report found that the police investigation was, and I quote, marred by a combination of professional incompetence, institutional racism, and a failure of leadership, unquote. Amongst its 70 recommendations, it also abolished the double jeopardy rule, which stated that people could not be tried for the same crime twice, leading in 2012 to the conviction of Gary Dobson and David Norris for Stephen's murder. And a year later, in um, what was that, 2000, Race Relations Amendment Act was passed to give effect to many of these recommendations. Meanwhile, following ongoing and growing concerns about the paucity of women MPs, 
2002 saw the Sex Discrimination Election Candidates Act, an enabling measure which allows political parties to use positive discrimination to improve women's representation in elected bodies. Between 2003 and 2007, four pieces of legislation were enacted to, pro to prohibit discrimination directly and indirectly on grounds of religion and belief and sexual orientation. The Civil Partnership Act 2004 permitted same-sex couples to form civil partnerships. The Civil Partnerships Marriages and Deaths Registration Act 2019 extended this to include opposite-sex couples after a case that went to the Supreme Court in 2018, whilst the Marriage Same-Sex Couples Act 2013 permitted same-sex marriage. Then, it, also in 2004, the Gender Recognition Act, whilst technically not a piece of anti-discrimination legislation, established a process for a transgender person to apply to a tribunal for a gender recognition certificate to permit them to be legally recognised in the gender they live in, albeit that the process and requirements remain highly contested. The Disability Discri Discrimination Act 2005 extended and improved rights for disabled people by amending the 1995 Act to establish a new public sector equality duty, similar to the race equality duty. The Act also introduced provisions to increase accessibility of rail vehicles. Anti-discrimination legislation was extended to older workers by the Employment Equality Age Regulations 2006, later supplemented by the Employment Equality Repeal of Retirement Age Provisions Regulations 2011, which prohibited compulsory retirement taking place unless objectively justified. The 2006 Equality Act established the Commission for Equality and Human Rights, which later became known as the EHRC. This brought together the work of the DRC, the EOC and CRE and extended powers to cover all identities protected in law as well as advancing rights. The Act also created a public sector equality duty to promote equality of opportunity between women and men, similar to the race and disability duties. And finally, all of the above was consolidated and harmonised into the current Equality Act 2010. This recognises and affords protection to nine protected characteristics or identities. Age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion and belief, and sex, including for those associated with or presumed to have such an identity in employment, education, goods, facilities and services, premises and public functions. It brings together and extends all to all protected characteristics except marriage and civil partnership, the three existing public sector equality duties requiring public bodies to have due regard in carrying out their functions to eliminate unlawful discrimination, advance equality of opportunity and foster or encourage good relations. By the way, you'll be examined on all of this later on. So. <laughs> Incidentally, Northern Ireland has different but similar legislative arrangements because of its separate political and historic considerations resulting in the Good Friday Agreement. I should also note that separate criminal legislation has progressively outlawed hatred on grounds of race, religion, disability, sexual orientation and transgender identity. Meanwhile, the European Union and its predecessor, the European Economic Community, of which we were of course a member for over 47 years, developed and evolved its own equality laws, which informed the laws of member states, including the UK. In particular, the Treaty of Rome 1957 prohibits discrimination on grounds of nationality and sets out the principle of equal pay for men and women for equal work. And then Article 1 of the Lisbon Treaty 2007 states that, quote, the union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. These values are common to the member states in a society in which pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity and equality between women and men prevail. Consequently, these treaties generated over a dozen equality directives. More recently, the British government has announced an ambition to repeal the Human Rights Act and replace it with a denuded British Bill of Rights. Under the premiership of Elizabeth Truss, that was put on hold. But as of the 25th of October 2022, with Dominic Raab, a long-time opponent of the Human Rights Act, back as Justice Secretary, who knows for how long, the bill may well return. 
As an aside, even if the Human Rights Act is repealed, it's unclear whether the UK will remain a member of the 46-member state Council of Europe and so be bound by the European Convention on Human Rights and subject to the European Court of Human Rights. Abolition of the Human Rights Act may have other consequences, including undermining the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland. Finally, the UK is a signatory to the United Nations, to United Nations treaties, several of which address equality, including the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the Convention on the Rights of Children, and the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities, some of which permit for direct complaints by individuals. So, perhaps unsurprisingly, we can see that in parallel to the gross growth of progressive agendas, the law has evolved to address inequality and exclusion. Indeed, I would argue that some of the more brutish and egregious examples of oppression are now less likely than before, albeit by no means eliminated. To put it another way, the center of gravity has shifted towards inclusion, driven by a symbiotic relationship between progressive campaigns and the law. To explore this further, I will now turn to the use of law, not just to afford a remedy to a wronged person, but more broadly to drive change, to drive inclusion. In their guide to strategic litigation, the Public Law Proje Project, the PLP, has defined it as a method to bring about significant changes in the law, practice or public awareness via taking carefully selected cases to court. Strategic litigation is sometimes referred to as impact or test case litigation and, and aims include creating public awareness and debate, setting important precedents and achieving change for people in similar situations and policy change, sometimes regardless of success in the actual case. Relatedly, public interest litigation originated in the US to achieve social reform and benefit disadvantaged social groups. It was taken up in the UK and also elsewhere, such as in India, which has championed poverty-oriented jurisprudence. Strategic litigation has a long history, illustrated by the case of Somerset v. Stewart, 1772, which established the right of an enslaved person on English soil not to be forcibly removed and sent to another country for sale, for example, Jamaica. The case attracted a great deal of attention in the press, and members of the public donated money to support the lawyers involved, incidentally on both sides of the argument. In the US in the early 20th century, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, one of the oldest and most significant black civil rights organizations, used strategic litigation as a core part of their campaigns and activism, and in 1916 created its own in-house legal department. The most celebrated case brought by the NAACP was undoubtedly the successful school desegregation case, Brown v. the Board of Education of Topeka of 1954, though it's notable that success brought about a fierce backlash by conservative interest groups in the form of the so-called Southern Manifesto. In the UK, the housing charity Shelter, the human rights charity Liberty, the Child Poverty Action Group and others, including the Equality Commissions, built a reputation for taking strategic and public interest litigation. For example, the PLP took cases challenging the response of local authorities to homelessness applications by children and a local authority's decision to cut funding for community-based mental health services. In their 2015 paper, Effective Use of the Law by the Voluntary Sector, the Bering Foundation also give a number of examples of successful strategic litigations, and I would like to highlight four which, in my mind, directly impact inclusion. Limbuella was brought by Liberty, the human rights charity, to prevent destitution among asylum seekers who had failed to apply for asylum, quote, as soon as, practically, as, as, soon as reasonably practicable, unquote. Success in the House of Laws resulted in a change in the interpretation of the Nationality, Immigration and Asylum Act 2002 to read socioeconomic entitlements into civil and political rights documents and statutory guidance was re revised such that the case has had a direct impact on reducing destitution within the asylum system. In the East Sussex County Council case of A and B, 
brought by the Disability Rights Commi Commission, a challenge was made against the blanket no-lifting policies that failed to take into account the specific needs of disabled individuals. A High Court judgment found a violation of their right to respect for private and family life in Article 8 of the Human Rights Act and went on to provide a framework for public authorities to balance the dignity of the individual with the health and safety of employees through individualised risk assessments. Some of you may have heard of the Southall Black Sisters case, a case challenging Ealing Council's decision to withdraw funding for domestic violence services, services focused on black and minoritised ethnic women. The council conceded during the hearing, but nonetheless, the judge gave a ruling and provided helpful guidance regarding the application of the race equality duty. And finally, Rutherford v Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, sometimes known as the bedroom tax case, which was brought by the Child Poverty Action Group to challenge discrimination against disabled children and their carers who require an extra room. It resulted in a successful ruling of unlawful discrimination and therefore a change in practice affecting disabled children across the country, disabled people actually across the country. Part of my career as a solicitor was spent at Levine Solicitors where I led a specialist department as Sasha has kindly described. And I took cases for several charities and non-governmental organizations representing and supporting disabled children. I'd like to pick a few. In Regina versus Ipsia, the Independent Panel for Special Education Advice, I acted for the charity in a challenge to, to guidance produced by the Secretary of State. The Court of Appeal held that a school's approach to disabled children must always meet, and I quote, the needs of the child and not the needs of the system, unquote. And that had a significant impact on the lives of many disabled children at school. In an East Sussex County Council case, Bird and others, we effectively changed a policy which refused to specify in detail provision um, to meet the needs of children with Down syndrome, the consequence of which was to enhance rights again across the country. Similarly, in uh, Regina versus Harrow, the High Court held that the local education authority had an, quote, absolute non-delegable duty to arrange specialist provision and that specifically they could not rely on a lack of resources argument, nor indeed on whether somebody else should provide that support as a reason for not doing so. And finally, in Buniac, be the governing body of Jen, Jenny Hammond, Hammond Primary School, there was a technical but non, nonetheless important point about whether schools should support disabled children even if they don't have what was then known as statements of special educational needs. So given all of this, Turning to the title of this lecture, surely the answer, can the law deliver inclusion, is yes, not quite. And I would finally like to turn to the law's limitations. First, whilst equality law can clearly address power imbalances between public and pri or private organisations and individuals, it is not very good at resolving competing or contested private rights between individuals. For example, if a person wishes only to associate with people like them and not others, the law has little to say about that, and indeed I would say it shouldn't. Whilst I would challenge that person's perspective and decisions, I don't believe that the law should. Second, it's also not very good at handling conflicts of morality or beliefs between individuals. For example, concerning disputes between disabled people and feminists over abortion rights. It may be able to apply a rule, but it doesn't resolve the underlying tensions. Third, proponents of critical legal studies assert that laws are anyway not neutral and to some degree are devised and implemented to maintain the status quo. This may seem contradictory given my analysis of the developing legal framework to advance equality, but I believe that their arguments have some merit. In summary, this analysis was principally founded by a group of legal scholars in the US who, reflecting on their experience with the civil rights movement, Vietnam protests, and other political and cultural challenges to authority, noted that the weight of the law against progress seemed to contradict the assumption that American law was fundamentally just and the product of historical progress. Instead, the law seemed like a game, heavily loaded to favor the wealthy and powerful. From that perspective, law positively mit mitigates against demolition of structures that inhibit 
full inclusion. It is essentially conservative, at best incremental, not radical, preserving lit legitimacy. And note, for example, the adage, property is nine-tenths of the law. In her book, Gender, Alterity and Human Rights, Freedom in a Fishbowl, Ratna Kapoor argues that Western human rights are axiomatic with liberal freedom and that human rights have been deployed to advance political and cultural intents rather than bring about freedom for disenfranchised groups. I'm not sure that I would go that far, but I see her point. Similarly, critical race theory posits that the law cannot be race blind, and Kimberly Crenshaw and others, one of its most, sorry, Kimberly Crenshaw, one of its most significant proponents, and others argue that the law fails to see the intersection, for example, of race and gender. In any event, my anecdotal experience is that notwithstanding the successes outlined earlier, the, the law cannot be too far ahead of society. It cannot move more than, say, five degrees beyond the current cent centre of hegemonic gravity. On the other hand, it can move it, and it can be moved by it. Laws can not only act as a bulwark against oppression, but can provide and frame a national moral compass, including a framework about who we are. When it comes to liberation and inclusion, however, it is a starting point, a floor, not a ceiling. Fourth, even the concepts of equality embedded in law, that of opportunity and outcome, is limited, although our public sector equality duty does arguably reach further. In essence, I believe that these concepts of equality law are rooted in Western liberal concepts of fairness in a competition, rather than, for example, overall dignity. And to that extent, the impact on inclusion is reduced. In contrast, it's worth considering a couple of other approaches. Ubuntu is an African concept which focuses on community. Quote, a person is not a person without people, unquote, or I am because we are. It is a belief in a universal bond of sharing that connects all humanity. The African Journal of Social Work defines it as a collection of values and practices that people of Africa or of African origin view as making people authentic human beings. While the nuances of these values and practices vary across different ethnic groups, they all point to one thing. An authentic individual human being is part of a larger and more significant relational communal, societal, environmental, and spiritual world. Critically for this lecture, Ubuntu is central to the post-apartheid South African constitution and its inclusion of socioeconomic rights, and prioritizes a communal, as opposed to individual or competitive, approach to the understanding of rights, and how they are integral in fostering harmony within a multicultural society. Buen Vivir is a South American indigenous pluralistic worldview. It translates to good living or well living, a concept of collective well being, harmony driven, doing things in a way that is community centric, ecologically balanced, and culturally sensitive, not about the individual, but instead the individual in the social context of their community. Both of these philosophies shift attention from individuals to communities. And bring me to my final critique of the law as a driver for inclusion and what it lacks. I want to turn to consideration of personal relationships and allyship as transformative tools for advancing inclusion and eliminating oppression. As mentioned earlier, I hold strongly to the analysis of oppression as structural and systemic, but that nonetheless individual relationships are key. This part of my thesis is very much anecdotal, drawing considerably from my experience as a disabled person and drawing on conversations and relationships with many people, some of whom I've already mentioned, including Tom Shakespeare, who has written importantly about some of these themes. The following are ideas and considerations which are very much the shared product of my personal relationship and work with Yates Norton, which we have discussed and developed in a number of colloquia, colloquia and in a recently published article, as Sasha mentioned, in the online journal Tohu. Accordingly, I use the pronoun we to reflect this. As I mentioned at the beginning, as humans, we are both different and the same. At its best, this can engender lives characterized by commitment, care, allyship, and interdependence. 
The unity that comes through relationship building challenges a worldview that says that human flourishing can best be achieved through individual and national competitive engagement. In doing so, it can provide the foundation of inclusion. In a particular way, disabled people have long had to consider the meaning of human connection, care and relationships, often because they've been treated not only as less than or subhuman, but critically as dependent, which when juxtaposed with society's norms that elevate the importance of independence in adulthood, infantilizes them and militates against true equality and reciprocity in relationships. The history of the disability movement in the UK is at heart about reframing. For example, David Mitchell with Sharon Snyder argued that, quote, inclusion is only worthy of this designation if disability becomes more fully recognized as providing alternative values for living that do not simply reify reigning concepts of normalcy. Further, legalistic approaches to equality not only fail to recognize the extent of the importance of relationships and interdependency, but also of art, culture, and forms of representation within those relationships. Last year, Yates and I participated in a public conversation presented in the context of a screening of the film Face of Our Fear, 1991, by the major avant-garde disabled filmmaker Stephen Dwoskin. In the conversation, we drew on the work of the disabled queer Korean writer Mia Mingus and her concept of access intimacy. For Mingus, inclusion and accessibility should not simply be a logistical legal requirement or a mechanistic set of accommodations. Accessibility is not only about justice for those who are structurally excluded, but also liberation and transformation for everyone, since separation and isolation militates against interdependence and hence human flourishing. We must focus on lived experience and also human connection in thinking about both rights and justice work, foregrounding our understandings through intimacy as a key part of liberatory work. Of course, such understandings come from long-term commitment and listening to each other, which in turn requires relationship building, not simply service provision. As Mingus writes, the understanding of access needs emerge out of our shared similar lived experience of the many different ways ableism manifests in our lives. Mingus is making a point about the crucial role of intimacy, attention and care in liberatory work beyond questions of access and inclusion. Given that accessibility and disabled people are so often treated as problems requiring logistical solutions, Mingus is compelled to underscore this point. We share Mingus's emphasis here, as well as the frustration that such basic elements of human connection, of love and commitment, have to be emphasized, for some, but not us, embarrassingly so. It reveals the extent to which disabled people have been dehumanized. This brings us back to a core part of our thinking, the key importance of relationships to achieving liberation and inclusion, and that these relationships are interdependent. Through this, we recognize how we are transformed by connection and not the division that comes through individualism and competition. There are many examples of this, and for now I will point to two. First, the alliance and allyship between coal miners and LGBTQ plus activists during the miners' strike in the 1980s, as memorialized in the 2014 movie Pride. And second, Richard Wilkins and Kate Pickett's work, The Spirit Level and The Inner Level, which highlight the, quote, pernicious effects that inequality has on societies, eroding trust, increasing anxiety and illness. So what is interdependence? We posit it as the mutual reliance and flourishing that arises between two or more groups or individuals. It differs from dependent relationships and those where some are dependent and some are not. It is also different from what is often described as codependency, a pejorative concept implying the mutual reinforcing of what are essentially emotional hurts. Importantly, it is yet also different from independence which, particularly in neoliberal forms of late-stage capitalism, valorizes competition in ever-increasing aspects of community and society. In interdependent relationships, each party may be emotionally, economically, ecologically, or morally reliant on, but also responsible for and to each other. 
Many authors, philosophers, theologians, and leaders have written and spoken about interdependence in many cultures throughout history. But for disabled people, it has a particular resonance given their history of exclusion. Interdependence directly challenges oppressive narratives and requires of us all that we not only recognize, but also benefit from the full humanity of each, critically, regardless of whether we, even, whether we agree or even like each other. Keeping interdependence at the forefront of how we think through our relationships and with others allows us to recognize, celebrate, and honor difference without creating or entrenching division. At the same time, difference or identity can be a double-edged sword. It can be the means through which oppression is resisted by providing an identity we can cohere around, but it can also be the means through which oppression operates by classifying, marking out, separating and controlling individuals of that identity. For this and other reasons, in recent times, there has been a growth of analyses and positioning of identity politics, political positions based on the interests and perspectives of social groups with which people identify. There is, again, not time to explore the many and various movements and writers who have considered the meaning and relevance of identity, but these ideas do raise profound questions about unity and separateness. At heart, we believe that we need to address and name oppression as it relates to people of particular identities, but at the same time, ensure that our identities do not wholly define us. This is difficult, but we must grapple and allow ourselves to be unsettled by these complexities. Critically, this can only happen if we sustain attention and connection through commitment. Foucault says some interesting things about the importance of relationships and unity. For example, he talks about homosexuality in terms of the relations that can be established, invented, multiplied, multiplied and modulated. One of these relations being friendship. And so to want someone was wanting a relation with someone. This relation can trouble and disrupt alliances which have been prescribed in a hegemonic idea of what relationships should be. Quote, a way of life can be shared among individuals of different age, status, and social activity. It can yield intense relations not resembling those that are institutionalized. It seems to me a way of life can yield a culture and an ethics, unquote. So back to commitment. At least in our culture, Increasing weight seems to be placed on a person's purported individual qualities, whether they are likable or not, for which there are innumerable subsets, attractive, powerful, witty, virtuous, etc. In some ways, this approach is no doubt a function of ordinary complex human relationships, what draws us to some people and not others. But in as much as that is at least partly socially constructed, which I believe it is, it is encouraged by an increasingly neoliberal individualistic dominance. There are many consequences to this, including, some have argued, a rise in nationalism and populism as a reaction to atomized communities and an attempt to elevate the collective against that atomization that, accomplishes, sorry, that accompanies individualism. That aside, the breadth and depth of human connection is undermined by this individualism. In particular, the essence of belonging is fractured by the constant qualification of the requirement of being liked or attractive or powerful or virtuous or witty, and also that we must hold the same or similar views. Even if we are ostensibly successful in this competition, we nonetheless, nonetheless live under the threat of failure. We can easily fall off our pedestal. Commitment, then, is, is the decision to remain in a relationship or community, notwithstanding the vagaries of individual factors, although I accept that they are not irrelevant and clearly there are complicating circumstances. We think of inclusion as ongoing and relational. We can never fully know someone, but we must nonetheless always strive to know them beyond our attitudes and assumptions about them, and regardless of whether we like them or don't, fall in love or out of love with them, etc., of course, this is never an easy or smooth journey. Indeed, the closer one gets to another, the more each person's struggles are revealed, and this can make relationships more difficult. But as much as we are not expendable and cannot be treated as problems requiring solutions, we also are not easily consumable. We are never finished as if we were a product. Using a key word in Eli Clare's writing, we have to grapple with each other as complex living beings in all our changing diversity of experiences, feelings, and ways of living in and sensing the world. So what is the answer to the question? 
Fundamentally, we do need law and policies, but we also need more. Transformation through relationships. Relationships are important because they are necessary to reevaluate historic structural disadvantage and will ultimately lead to unity. Thank you. Thank you, David, for a fantastic lecture. Um, it's now my pleasure, A, to be dazzled by the lights, um, but secondly, to open up a Q&A uh, with David. And before I do that, just to say my name is Donald McGillivray, and I'm the head of the law school at Sussex. Um, we've got about 20 minutes or so, um, not just for Q&A, but as David said, he would also welcome comments, disagreements, and possibly even mild heckling. Um, and uh, in the spirit of inclusion, we would um, like to encourage questions or comments from students and non-academic guests first, and if they're not forthcoming, then the academics can get their, their chance. There are two roving mics on either side, I believe. So, who would like to kick off? Ah, oh, that's better. There's the exam that they have to do at the end about the law. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Thankfully, there's not an exam. There is a question there. And if we can get a discussion Hello. going, that would also be wonderful. Uh, I always want to ask who's going to win the World Cup, but that might be the last question <laughs> to answer. But um, I've never read a law book, and I've never read like how the laws are written out. But one of the things that I've always been interested in is how we understand, or we think we understand what our rights are, enshrined in the law but often we don't understand what our responsibilities are and I'm kind and it seems to me that that intimacy care relationships really carry lots of responsibilities and I don't know if they're written down they they may be um, but I've always been struck by the fact that I have the right to hold an opposing view and I have the right to let you know that I disagree with you but I have a responsibility to do that in a particular way and I wonder if the law needs to address that. Um, that's, a, that's a live argument, as you might know, Rob, at the moment. Um, and in fact, it's part... The crit criticisms of the Human Rights Act, particularly from the right, are framed in that way. It talks about people's rights, but not their responsibilities. And it won't surprise you to know that that's not where my political leanings are. But I think, nonetheless, there's something interesting in that. There's something interesting. And I think that the focus on rights in the way that it has been characterised um, is part of an individualistic way of thinking. That doesn't mean to say that I think rights are wrong. I think rights are right, if it's possible to say that. But um, I do think that what's rights in the context of individualism is singular and... Um, narrowly focused. Whether we then think about the law by framing it in terms of responsibilities, I'm not so sure because then it becomes a, a tension or a, bi, you know, a kind of like a um, tug of war type approach. I suppose I'd rather be, uh, what's interesting to me is thinking about rights more in the context of relationships and the, and the, and the idea of interdependence and the idea of mutuality in that way, rather than to posit responsibilities as the opposite of rights sort of thing. But, I mean, these are sort of semi-formed thoughts, and I'm sure colleagues here may have other better thoughts. Thanks, David. Are there any questions that follow on from that theme? Different question. <laughs> if not, let's have another question, and let's just open it up generally. <clears throat> Great, thanks. Um, I'm a researcher and a PhD student at IDS, but I have a growing interest in the law. Um, my question is about commitment. I think that's a fantastic way to, to finish the talk. I think it, it really encapsulates, I mean, I would agree that it encapsulates really, um, you know, my idea as well of inclusion. Um, but just in terms of, of um, maybe mindsets regarding commitment, it, did you, and I, maybe I would um, ask you to expand on it if that's possible, um, but whether you mean that, you know, we should 
make a specific effort to commit to one another as human beings, or whether we should only, for, for example, simply have an openness to commitment mm. uh, towards one another. Because, you know, if, you know, I may not get along with my neighbor, with everybody, um, so it, you know, we may choose not to commit to each other, but, or maybe your opinion is that we should kind of regardless and that only, and also whether inclusion can only really happen when commitment has been made towards each other. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I don't know the answer. I think those are great questions. Um, I mean, I genuinely don't know because I think these are, um, in one, as a theory, well, maybe not as a theory because there are many other people who have written a lot better, a lot more and a lot better than this brief summary that I've given. But I, I like to talk about commitment um, really as a, as a counterpoint to this idea of choice, uh, where we essentialize choice um, as the basis for everything, really, whether it's shopping or um, people. Um, and I, I think there are probably there are different types of commitment. There's not one kind of commitment, but I, we can be committed to everybody in a community, such as in a university. We may have very little to do with lots of people, given that there are, well, here, 18,000 students and 3,500 staff. We may not even meet many of them. We probably won't. But we, I think there's something about a mindset of a commitment to them. And, of course, that will be very different from a commitment to somebody you share a house with or your partner or a friend or whoever it is. So there are probably gradations and uh, differentials. But I, to me, it's more of a... a, a making a stand about this idea that we're just going to pick the people who right now are the ones that are valid and not those who aren't and ignore the rest at best ignore the rest it's something about that I'm not sure that i'm very clear in my mind but something along those lines thank you very much that's great thanks <coughs> yes the lady in front of Um, whether I'll talk loud, like, loudly. Uh, you're going to have to excuse the, the kind of plain English language, David, but I'm really interested in the idea, what happens when you have two groups who are excluded, if you like, who are in conflict? Where does the law... How does that work? Well, I mean, that's happened a lot. We can all think of examples, and I gave one about um, some disabled activists and um, some feminists around abortion... There's a current ongoing conflict between um, many, some um, disabled activists and what appears to be the majority population supporting a relaxation of the law in respect of assisted suicide. Um, and both sides feel that, that, um, um, that their, their the essence of, what, of their strong beliefs is existentially central to, to their existence. M maybe that's putting it a bit too strongly for those who advocate for assisted suicide, but for them, often it's um, a matter of terror of having to face the most awful, painful death. Um, I, I, there isn't an easy answer, but I think you have to have a relationship. What's interesting to me, if I just take that example, what's very interesting to me, and I have happened to look into that, um, all of the legal cases that have gone um, to court which have sought to affect a relaxation in the law of assisted, that would otherwise prevent assisted suicide, have been brought by people who've become disabled, um, acquired something. It might be a very um, awful progressive condition, um, but they've become disabled or had an accident and become disabled later in their life. And when you unpick that, what's interesting is what's behind it is a sense of a huge sense of loss and fear, understandable loss and fear, that um, loss of the lives that they've had and fear of the um, deteriorating sense of self and sometimes a lot of fear of pain, it's certainly true, or, or you know, whatever it is that they fear is likely to happen. Whereas there are many disabled people who have that level of impairment, 
who are born with that level of impairment um, maybe have never been able to feed or clothe themselves or wash themselves or um, toilet themselves, but don't have that sense of loss and therefore their sense of themselves is different and don't feel that they need to die or they want to be helped to die. And rather fear that the, the, um, the, the narrative around we need to be able to die threatens their existence existentially. So what do you do about that? Because those are they're mutually exclusive positions, frankly. You're not going to reach a nice, a nice answer, certainly by examining those positions. But I do think through relationships, people can come to know and understand things differently. I mean, it's very easy. To, you can talk about these things in trite ways, and people talk about their other half, you know, or the, when they're talking about their partners, almost in, or that this person completes me. But there, and there are many examples in everyday use, but I think this is true on a meta level, um, and that we probably need that for some of the most intractable conflicts that we have between groups. Um, and that, that's why I think, you know, the law is not... The law can give us a rule and say, we'll do this, but not that. And some people may, be, may feel vict victorious or justified and others will feel um, the, the oppressed. But it won't... And therefore, it won't solve that conflict. I mean, even... There's many instances, for example, that have been in many cases between people of faith and LGBTQ act activists. There's the... the um, bed and breakfast case in Devon or Cornwall and there was the um, gay cake case in Northern Ireland some of you may remember and you can get a rule which will which will decide what the law says but it doesn't resolve the conflict not really I mean so you have to have some, whether it's what I say or something else if you look if your ambition is inclusion and def depending on how you define it but you you talk about and inclusion for me must mean harmony um, and togetherness and connectedness and all, all those other things, then I think you have to have something around relationships. Thank you. But please disagree with me. <laughs> um, I don't know, Sasha, if you're going to disagree with David, but you certainly had your hand up. I could. <laughs> um, I think that was a, a really fabulous lecture, David. Thank you. Um, I, I can offer kind of one... one question, challenge, and, and one maybe point of disagreement. The question and challenge, I suppose, is to extrapolate from what you've said here, which is, I think, developing a kind of an analysis that says that law and policy are the kind of necessary conditions for inclusion, but then they're, they're not enough. Um, and that it's in the relational sphere that, that inclusion is achieved. Um, so, so the question there is, so what's the implication of that for uh, equality, diversity and inclusion work within the university. Um, you know, how does this relate to, to your PVC work? Um, what's, what's the agenda, therefore, for us at Sussex? Um, and then I suppose the challenge is, is a kind of psychoanalytic challenge of uh, this kind of ideal world in which we can reach some kind of state of inclusion and harmony and unity. You ended on unity. It's a lovely optimistic notion. But actually people are divided, conflicted, not unified within themselves, you know, constantly in conflict within themselves um, and in their relationships. Relationships are not just harmonious. They are disagreeable. They are you know, they're, they're mm. full of conflict. Mm. Um, so how do you deal with that? Um, how would I deal with that? Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean... Yes, perhaps I should start by saying I don't know. Uh, I do think, though, that... Um, I mean, you, I revert to, to my own life and my own experience and to anecdote. So um, if you are noticeably disabled, which I am and other people here are, you, you know, you, you, you see how things are in the world moment, um, in, immediately. So new people meet you, you can see in their eyes if there's some discomfort or uncertainty, often there's kind of not wanting to get it wrong, the whole range of things. And I'm sure other people with no noticeable differences, whether it's your, because of your heritage or um, even, you know, sex differences as well, will, you know, there are differences. We will all become attuned to them. But we also notice that through connection, that dissolves. 
to a considerable degree, maybe not completely, but it does. Now, that might be superficial, and maybe there is a core of, uh, of um, or an irreducible separateness, which is um, not commensurate with interdependence. But my instinct is that that's not true. Um, and even if it were, it's more interesting to think of it as being not true, because you can just achieve more than if you assume that difference is, is in some way uh, insurmountable. In, difference in the sense of keeping people apart is insurmountable. Um, and, I mean, there is the other side. I mean, there's so much here, but there's the other side of it that as we become closer to each other, we reveal ourselves more and more of the you know, the, the difficult bits, the, the stuff which is hard, which we try and hide from ourselves, let alone from anybody else. And, and you know, and 50% of marriages or relationships end in divorce or separation and all of that stuff which is obvious and familiar. But I suppose I, I shrink at the idea that that's in any way inevitable because of the nature of human beings. And it doesn't seem to me to be the case. So I would say when I was, I'm, what am I in? 183 years old, so I was born whenever that was. But anyway, since I was a child, things are different for disabled people now. There's no doubt about it. There are th things are different for the way that people think about disabled people and talk to disabled people. doesn't mean to say that there's no oppression. In, of course. And I would contend that that's true generally. Now, it's, you know, and then people will understandably say, but there's this terrible thing that's happening there. What about that? And there are terrible terrible things and I don't have a prob probably what I should have said at the beginning is I don't have a road map but I think that my best bet is to maintain and increase legal protection because because of this moral center of gravity point that it and giving people a remedy but that it but that you also then build on that um, and the bottom line is I don't know what else to do um, or at least I don't have another model. So to, on your point about what does that mean for a university, I think that, I mean, I've got this in my, as you know, my job title, I have this fascinating extra bit, not just about equality, but about culture. And I think it's, we, you know, what does it mean for us to build a culture which is all, all the things that we would agree we want, collegiate, not collegiate because it's nice, but also because of, you know, what we're here to do, teaching, learning, research and knowledge exchange, and that you that all happens in that way. But also a place where people want to be. What does that mean? And I've got ideas, but I suspect we all have ideas. In fact, I'm sure we all have ideas. But I think it must mean reaching for um, uh, facing conflict and moving through it rather than pretending it's not there. And also assume also not assuming that conflict is inevitable. Please disagree with me. <laughs> yes, question. Hello, um, David. Thank you for your lecture. Um, you asked for disagreement, so <laughs> you're going to get it. Um, following on from what Sasha was saying, you, you talked earlier about the law being just a little bit ahead of um, society. And it sounds like you've got quite a positive view of the role that law can play in terms of pushing um, for equality, and I'd agree with you. But it also seems to me that at the moment, the law is under attack, of left, right, and centre. Um, so when I was younger, you had symbols of the law, judges being attacked for being very conservative in their viewpoints, and now it's almost the opposite. And what my, my, my kind of thought as you were talking was that's all well and good so long as there is respect for the rule of law and the acceptance of the way the law works. And I just feel that if you've got a situation where in very recent times the, the advisor to the government on legal affairs is attacking the role of the people who are imp implementing the law, then that creates fear in my in, my, in myself about whether or not the law can can do what you say in terms of delivering inclusion because it's not theoretical it's it's the it's the actors involved in the law it's the police it's the judges it's the legal it's this legal system and 
you know, some of these things feel like they're slipping backwards. So I, I'm just a bit worried about the future. I well, I, is it Gavin? I can't see you. It is Gavin, yeah. yeah, I can't. I wouldn't disagree with you, Gavin. And by the way, if I, I'm not, and maybe I said this in which case I didn't mean it. I don't think the law is necessarily ahead of everybody else. I think it's symbiotic. I think it can pull and be pulled by. I mean, I prob <laughs> there's a lot more I could have said about that, but I, I wanted to try and think about social movements and the law and the juxtaposition of the two. Um, so I think the law can be pulled by prog progressive movements and it can then in, um, then support progressive movements in a quite complicated way. But I don't disagree with you. I think that ju just as, you know, we're in the US today, there's a, an election which could see um, the victory of a party, a significant number of whom appears to wish to reject the foundation stones of, of um, a law-based society, in my view. Um, and if that were to happen, who knows what's going to happen? So I, maybe this is... What I take from your point is that we can't be complacent. Yeah, and I agree with you. We can't be... I would agree with you. Sorry, you haven't... I haven't disagreed with you, so. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, that was brilliant. Um, and just to, I guess, follow up on a different point of Sasha's, which is to refer to your title, and to ask you to elaborate a bit more about the linkages or tensions between equality and inclusion. And because you started off with inclusion and then moved on to equality, and then I think summarized, uh, closed again with inclusion. But I want to posit that well, I want to ask you to, uh, to reflect on the ways that in equality and inclusion can be in tension. And I'm thinking, for example, we were tasked in, in clinics, in law school, or asked by a creative industry sector to get around the Equality Act to promote diversity. Because what they were saying is we want to have, so it's an extremely non-diverse sector, and um, we can't discriminate in favor yeah. of Etc. We gave them a solution, by the way, which is interesting in the context that we're discussing now, because we said focus on socioeconomic status, because that's not a particular characteristic. But now there are moves to include poverty and socioeconomic status in the Equality Act, which would mean that we can't do that anymore. So even with regards to your role in the university, I'm just wondering, separate spaces, there are points though, that inclusion and equality I think our intention, and I wonder where you think what we can, what can, what can be done about it, and or um, how they can be synergized. I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's a, thanks, thanks, Amir. I, I think there's lots to be said about that. I mean, I mentioned I think equality is a is a liberal concept, really, I and mean, that's because it's framed in certainly British law and Western law as being fairness in a competition. And so the, the obvious reason why that is not enough is that if you have, say, services for everybody and services are just rubbish for everybody, um, inequality has little, uh, equality law has little to say about that. Interestingly, human, human rights jurisprudence does go a bit further because of its, its concepts of dignity as opposed to equality. And I think there's more that you can do with that there. Um, and even, even our... Most equality law is symmetric, so it pr protect, it's designed to afford rights to men and women, white people and black people, and so on. And, you could, and in a way, that has a neatness to it, but it doesn't really, in one sense, it won't take you very far in terms of the structural op oppression, which is not equal. Um, however, we have gone further. We, you know, we have a public sector equality duty. When I was at the Equality and Human Rights Commission, we put in sections, well, we didn't, the Labour government because it was them in Parliament, but uh, in my role as legal policy director, we got in there, in sections one and two, a, so a socioeconomic duty, a public sector duty, a bit like the, the one that applies to protected characteristics. But of course, the Act received rule was sent in April 2010. There was a general election in May 2010. David Cameron came into power and immediately announced that sections one and two w were never going to be brought into force, and they're not. But in Scotland, they've introduced a, a, a kind of very, I call it socioeconomic light, uh, 
Um, the logical conclusion, if, and I don't think we're going to get the, this anytime soon, but is to have equ um, uh, equality-focused law on socioeconomic disadvantage in employment as well as goods and services and the public sector duty. But in order for that to happen, you'd have to end capitalism, or at least late-stage capitalism, <laughs> probably. Um, because it would be, it would so thoroughly undermine so much of the precepts of inequality. It's what um, uh, Rich, Richard Williams and Kate Prickett talk, talk about, um, that I don't think we're going to get it. So there are, you know, I don't, maybe I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I, I don't think that there are, the equality law is not the answer to everything because for the, these and many other reasons. But inclusion... But it can do a lot, and it can do more than we used to think, especially when you look at indirect discrimination and the way that that plays out. You can bring in more things. And, you know, the reasonable adjustments duty, for, which is particular to the disability protected characteristic, which is an asymmetric obligation, has been transformative for disabled people. Um, public sector equality duty as well. There are, there are lots you can do, but I think we need to do more. Thank you, David. Uh, we've probably got time for one and possibly two questions if they were reasonably short. Um, sorry, you're pointing me here at the back. Yeah, can we get a mic there? Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the great lecture. I'm Kanika. I am a PhD student at, the, uh, at SPRU, Sussex Business School. I come from India, and uh, you know, hearing you speak about the developments the law has made, I, I, was, I realized that there's so much more that we need to do back in India, but I was rather glad to hear about the developments that UK has already made. But since I'm here, I would speak about uh, the UK law. Um, I, I have two questions, but you know, I will make it brief. Um, so the first one, how does the law treat uh, the terms disabled, differently abled and specially abled, how are they different? And if there's a definition, then how are they defined? And the second question is more personal. Um, so, um, you know, when, when I am around a more marginalized person than me, I would, I, I would constantly have this fear of not saying or doing the wrong thing and being politically correct. So, you know, wanted to hear your perspective on um, what do you think about living in this constant fear and what can we do to go beyond just living with that fear? Yeah, that's my question. Thank you. You're great. Thank you. I mean, I, I, I'll just keep, I'm obviously happy to answer your questions, but these are just my views. So other people will certainly have different views. So my own view, the law doesn't really talk about differently abled or specially abled, I think was the other thing you said. These are, I haven't come across the latter one, but differently abled I have come across. Um, personally, I'd, it's not what I would choose. Um, maybe I'll say something more general. Language changes all the time. Um, and when I, when I arrived in Sussex, I sort of arrogantly thought, oh, I've got this, I've written this language guide, so we can use that. And, I'll, and then the whole of the EDI team, some of them, well, you, I don't think many of them were here then, but said, you can't do that because we'll just get, somebody will be upset with something that we've said. And they're right, actually, because lang language changes all the time and not everybody agrees on it. Um, I personally don't like differently abled, personally, for me, because it feels um, like we're trying to avoid something, really. Um, let's, let's just think that everything is just different sort of thing without just naming something. So, but, but other people uh, do um, like it or use it, rather. Um, I think, that, so that's, I suppose that's not an issue for the law. The law doesn't talk about disabled people with people with disabilities. How we then communicate with each other is, you're free to do so. But it does bring me to your second point, about, which I think is, and thank you for being open about yourself in that regard. Um, I think everybody is scared and anxious about getting something wrong. And I think the only way we can get through that is through relationships. I, I, because no matter how many times we can prescribe the words that we use, and there are clearly some egregious words that we shouldn't use. There's, I'm not suggesting that anything goes. Some things which are 
evidently offensive. But language changes all the time. And the only way we will know and understand is by being in relationship with people. So I suppose that's another, what, what you've asked, is an example of what I'm trying to reach for. Um, and also, the, other, the final thing I'd say is, um, there isn't anybody who doesn't offend somebody. There just isn't. Include, and I certainly do. I don't, not intentionally, but I, <laughs> I have a particular responsibility in my role to try and avoid that. But um, I'm sure I do, and I, you know, and I apologise for. I do now apologise if I have done so. Um, but and but it's. I don't think it's possible to to not make mistakes if you're having, unless you know, unless you're a robot or something. They, they probably make mistakes all the time. Anyway, I'll stop <laughs> mithering. I'll go over here to do that. It's possible to get some lights on here, otherwise I'm going to be really struggling. Um, thank you. Uh, well, David, I don't think you caused any offence, so thank you for doing that. Um, I, I, I did, did you say you're an equality advisor still to the FA? Premier League. Premier League, yeah. okay. I thought you said the FA. I was going to think you're got a lot on your plate at the moment yeah. with the World Cup. But no, yes. <clears throat> um, Premier League is enough, by the way. They've got their own problems. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, anyway, um, it's my uh, wonderful duty to and honour at this point to be able to give the vote of thanks for David. Um, and on behalf of everyone, I'd like to say thank you, David, um, for a hugely insightful and wide-ranging lecture, a lecture which has drawn so adeptly and with such great clarity from your professional as well as your personal experience, and which was only enriched by the, uh, the answers that you gave to such a wide range of questions that you had at the end. Um, I imagine it must be a very daunting thing to, to, give a, to deliver an inaugural lecture, which is why I've never given one. <laughs> so I can only take my hat off to you, and I'm also looking at a couple of other law colleagues here who... Uh, uh, maybe due to give one as well. Maybe <laughs> haven't waited as long as I have. Um, as David reminds us, the role of the law uh, is not limited narrowly to, if I may quote you, to providing a bulwark against oppression, but law also provides and frames a national moral compass. Although, as you quite rightly said, sometimes, albeit only with in perhaps certain narrow parameters in terms of the extent to which Society may pull the law in one way, or the law may pull society in another way. Um, but law also reflects as, as well as shapes societal values. And in David's wide-ranging lecture, we were taken to places where different conceptions of equality are to be found, as through concepts such as Ubuntu, and then as David got on to talking about um, relationality um, and more communal and collective approaches. And you cited the real-world example of the South African Constitutional Court as an example of that. Um, and I'm sure that Justice Albie Sachs, who was the last person that I was in a similar position to in a big public lecture here, um, I'm sure he would have had a lot to find in common with what you were talking about in your speech. He's also a Sussex Law alumni. Oh, wow. Um, David then addressed the complex issue of enduring tensions such as between, on the one hand, the affirming of identities and, on the other, the importance of identi identities not being defining. And you spoke very eloquently about the role of the law in trying to mediate between conflicting ideas of the good life in some way or of identity and community and so on. Um, and in particular, the way that we have to overcome binaries of some kind or I win, you lose kind of approaches um, and to be creative in the way that law seeks to find solutions by bringing people together rather than setting them in polar opposites. Uh, finally, in conclusion, David, you reminded us that law is never the complete answer to social issues like equality, and we need to cherish, value, and nurture the underlying relationships on which the present and the future uh, in this area will rest. You've certainly given us much to reflect on, David, um, and there's a chance to talk further with David and amongst ourselves over drinks outside. And we'll 
that will be available until uh, 8 p.m. and that will be just in the foyer where we started. Um, and if you haven't seen them already in the foyer, there's some further information about the research that we do within law, politics and sociology uh, in relation to EDI uh, and also some publicity material about our wonderful master's courses which produce <laughs> such brilliant graduates as Henry who got a name check earlier. So please join me in thanking David for his excellent and incurably human lecture and in welcoming David as a Professor of Law at Sussex. Thank you.